It is just an honor and a privilege to be in Jerusalem, Israel, with Dr. Gabriel Nussbaum. And you're a double doctor. You're an MD and a PhD making a dental mouthwash for a periodontist who's a DMD. <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear about this entire journey. Um, okay. So, so we, what kind of MD? And then you got a PhD in immunology? Yes, so I have um, MD and a PhD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And I trained in internal medicine um, and did a PhD in immunology, in uh, B-cell immunology at Einstein. B-cell? Immunology. As opposed to a T-cell? Yeah, focusing on antibodies. And then um, in Israel, I've been more focused, my research is focused on the innate immune system. So... In 1999, there were receptors discovered that explained to us how the immune system, the first rapid response of the immune system, recognizes and responds to micro microbes like bacteria and viruses. It was always known that the response was there, but the receptors responsible for that response were not known. And then in 1999, a major discovery was made of toll-like receptors, which are a family of surface proteins responsible for recognizing and responding to the microbial world. And in 2008, there was already a Nobel Prize given for that discovery. So the toll-like receptors are very important for how the immune system makes that initial recognition and response in the presence of microbes, which is, of course, happening all the time in the oral cavity. And it explains to us a lot about inflammation and what's driving inflammation. It's this recognition and response and production of inflammatory mediators that's driving that inflammation. And in the oral cavity, it's happening all the time in disease. It's, um, I remember, I mean, I got out of school in 87 where you basically were led to believe that streptococcus mutans cause cavities and right. P. gingivalis cause periodontal disease. And now I hear they're discovering a new species living in the mouth like every three months. Right. Is that true? So it is fascinating how much has been discovered since we all went to school. I mean, everything I'm involved in are things that are, weren't known when I was in school, which is what makes it so exciting to be in, in fields that require you to always be learning and always be updating yourself. So yes, absolutely. P. gingivalis can't be thought of as a direct cause of periodontal disease. It's much, much more complex than that. And really, it's about the host response. I mean, what's causing ultimately that tissue destruction is all of that inflammation that's there. I want to talk about some old wives' tales. Well, I don't want to say old wives' tales. That sounds sexist. Why, why is it not old, old husband's <laughs> tales? But um, it seems like the people who have a lot of gum disease don't have cavities. And people who have a whole mouthful of cavities don't have gum disease. Is that observation real or not really? Well, I mean, there's one way to look at that, which is just about the clinical and... You know, I, I don't, I'm not the right person to comment on how good the clinical evidence is for that, but you would have to look at what is the real clinical evidence that supports that observation. I've heard it also from many dentists. You have heard that? many dentists, yes. I'm not the first crazy dentist yeah. that, that said that to you? <laughs> no. <clears throat> and, um, and then you, you can ask, well, why would that be? And then, of course, what could explain that very nicely is the host response. I mean, the way we respond to these bacteria is what's driving periodontal disease. And the same person who responds in a certain way and can control strep mutans may be responding too much and causing too much inflammation in response to all those microbes that are associated with periodontal disease. So it makes a lot of sense. So there's the one aspect of proving that kind of old wide husband tale is, um, is to look for the clinical evidence. And the other is to look on a mechanistic level to understand what could explain such an observation? So it's not really known yet. Well, again, so I think what is known is that certain types of immune responses or what we call today host responses to the microbes in the oral cavity will make you more likely to develop periodontal disease. Certain types of host responses will make you more likely to develop caries, and those are not the same. It is very, very different diseases, the two. So if the host is, say, say the host has um, uncontrolled diabetes, or if the host is a chain smoker, exactly, it would have a different response. Yes. So one is all of those environmental and systemic factors, and then the other is also really on a very basic level, when your immune system meets 
let's say, poor for a moment exchange of Alice, what happens in that encounter? If you are the type of person that responds very, very strongly and produces a lot of inflammation, well, that could be a, detri a detriment rather than a benefit. And if you're a hyper responder, so this concept of producing too much inflammation in response to the same challenge could make you more susceptible to disease and periodontal disease, whereas it may do different things in other conditions. So, um, you know, I'm from North America. I'm from Phoenix, and uh, I'm on the other side of the world near the Fertile Crescent. We, we've been told that the um, streptococcus mutans jumped to humans from cats in the Fertile Crescent area about 15,000 years ago. Do you, do you, did you hear that, believe that? Um, and, and, and the same with P. morphous. Was that a, um, how did that get in a human's mouth? Was that, um, how long has that been? Was, it, was that a transfer from a pig, a goat, a sheep, a chicken, something, something yeah. else? So I don't know in particular about the, the environmental, the natural niche of uh, strep mutans. I do know that it's, there are some fascinating um, studies coming out now tracing where did these microbes come from in the oral cavity. So, you, you know, now we live in the age of what's called next generation sequencing or deep sequencing, where we can take an environmental sample and it can be from the human mouth, it can be a soil sample, whatever you want, and actually do a deep dive into what are all of the microbes there. And we can do it on environmental samples today, but we can also actually do it in even archeological sites. So there's fascinating research tracing where did these bacteria come from and how long have they been associated with humans? So not my field, I've read some about it, but it is interesting today that Porphyromonas gingivalis, for example, as a, an, a, an example of bacteria of periodontal, associated with periodontal disease, that's, a human pathogen. So we don't see it in dogs or in mice or in other um, animals. Uh, so it seems like it's co-evolved with us at least for a very long time. It's been with the human mouth for a very long time, which, which also means that it's learned how to persist and live in this environmental niche because it's adapted to it. Another big question, and this is kind of taboo, people don't like to talk about it, but if you look at the other end of the human body, STDs, um, you know, they, they know the other in the body, you can pass bacteria, um, and, uh, and all that. So, so then they always wonder, okay, well, if I have gum disease and I'm kissing you, um, can I kiss you to gum disease and cavities and HPV and can, right. can does, can I infect you with a kiss? We know, like, you know, you can infect someone else with, um, a sex. Yeah. Can you infect someone with, a kiss at the other end. So I, I guess an important question here is um, which is an infectious disease versus just sharing microbes. So now we talk about the microbiome, which is the ent entirety of all of those microbes living at a certain site. It could be a mucosal site, it could be the mouth, it could be the anus, it could be the vagina, it could be anywhere, but there's a community that lives there. And, and there's one thing is to talk about the sharing of that community. So we know those communities become pretty well established early on in life. So the, so the mother will transfer a lot of those communities to the fetus or to the child when it becomes born. And then over the, the first months to years of life, there's some shifting in those communities until it's eventually stabilized. Then there's a separate question about pathogens. When, are those, when and how are those shared? Some of those, that sharing is very well known. And yes, you can certainly transfer some of the um, pathogenic organisms. So you, as you probably are very aware, there's a shift, for example, in um, head and neck cancer, in, certainly in the United States, to what's been a uh, smoking-associated disease to now a human papillomavirus-associated disease. So there's a been a, a spreading and penetrance of certain types of human papillomavirus into the oral cavity, and that it, there is a causative factor in head and neck cancer. It's mostly a different type, a slightly different type of cancer. It's a little bit more posterior, so it's oral pharyngeal cancer rather than the tongue tumors and the smokers. But the question is, where are those coming from? Well, it turns out some of the oncogenic, in other words, cancer-causing subtypes of HPV are coming through oral sex. 
So yeah, there you have a very classic example of transferring a pathogen that then establishes, establishes itself in the oral cavity, and that's being transferred through an oral sex encounter. And Michael Douglas was the first celebrity to admit that on TV and draw attention to it. That could be. I'm not you sure. Remember I'm not aware of and that Farrah that Fawcett, uh, remember Farrah Fawcett? Yeah. She her, died of uh, anal cancer, uh -huh. which is very, very rare. Mm. So the, the other question before we get on to um, what you're doing here is, um, and a lot of people now are talking about that the antibiotics are changing your microbiome. And you see studies that um, identical twins, one had antibiotics for an ear infection, the other one didn't, and now they're, they're different. Uh, maybe one's heavier or what have you. Um, what, what are your thoughts from what you've learned, everything about periodontal disease, mouthwash, and, and antibiotics? So <clears throat> antibiotics certainly have an effect on the uh, microbiome in the oral cavity and throughout the body, which is why when you take antibiotics, uh, you're certainly at higher risk for outgrowth of candidal species. So people on antibiotics will get yeast infections, women in the vagina, but also in the oral cavity, you can get outgrowth of candidal species. So that, that's good evidence for the fact that the um, shift, there's a shift going on in the microbial species because of the antibiotics. What's interesting is most of that is a transient effect. In other words, the microbiome, the microbial communities will come back to what they were a certain time period after the use of antibiotics. But there's no question, I agree with you completely, that antibiotics are having um, major impacts on our bodies and the environment. As you probably know, most antibiotic use is in um, uh, farm animals. So it's in, the it's in livestock, right. Yeah. And that's, that, Does that antibiotic is getting into the environment. So even in the soil, et cetera. So but if, I, if, how, I eat, yeah. if I eat chicken, um, if, I, if I eat animals that were, you know, 90% of antibiotics in the United States go into livestock, does that, how does that affect the person? Does it affect the person eating the hamburger, the chicken? That's a good, good question and a controversial question that I, I, I don't think I have a very clear uh, take on a good answer for that one. Okay. Um, it, it, interesting. Um, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how fast everything is changing. Yes. But um, I'm, I, I call my program Dentistry Uncensored. Now I don't want to talk about what any, everybody agrees on. Good. I like to uh, <clears throat> hit the controversies. I know a lot of dentists. A lot of them are my drinking buddies uh, at bars that after every root canal, they just give everyone a script of Pen VK and Vicodin. What, what would you say as an MD with a PhD in immunology to my homies that after every root canal or wisdom do, they just write Pen VK, 500 milligram, 28 tabs? What, what, what do you think of that? I think... I think it's a good idea to reevaluate that practice. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that carefully yeah, enough? Uh, <laughs> are you running for mayor of Dentaltown? <laughs> so uh, I actually uh, was involved in a study from the from the School of Public Health that looked at antibiotic use by by dentists. Um, how much of it was evidence based, and, and there isn't good evidence for that for those scripts. So I would recommend reevaluating the practice because. As we're all aware, there's a huge problem of antibiotic resistance among the bacteria that, are, that we're all exposed to. So there are superbugs today, mostly in the hospitalized patients, but there are some reports even in the community of exposure to superbugs. These are bacteria that have learned to be resistant to all, that, all known or many most known antibiotics. And a lot of that is coming from the training they're undergoing by being exposed all the time. And why are they exposed all the time? Well, we talked about the farming industry, the um, livestock industry, but it's also from overuse of antibiotics, not just by dentists, by physicians as well. Um, and then, see, I think all physicians, and, and I'm including dentists in that category, should uh, think carefully before putting a patient on antibiotics. Don't forget, they've only been around for you know, not that long, and, and already the bug, bugs are resistant, and people were living pretty well before them, but we don't probably need to be giving that much. And it's really weird because penicillin against bacteria, penicillin was actually discovered in a fungi. Yeah, well, so, most of the antibiotics are actually being produced by other microorganisms to fight each other. 
Yeah, that yeah. that's interesting. So yeah. penicillin is from a fungi yeah. fighting with a was it a eukaryote or a prokaryote? A or prokaryote. A prokaryote. Yeah. I, I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So so tell us about your journey. Then I, I assume one day um, you were um, uh, Billy's patient, uh, William <laughs> William Z Levine, but you call him Billy, don't you? Yeah. Um, so is that how this all started? You you were a patient at Billy's periodontal practice. How, how did you and a periodontist named Billy meet up? And uh, tell us about your journey. How did that happen? Okay, so we actually it's a nice story. We were both sitting together at a at a table at a fiftieth wedding anniversary of common uh, common friends, and uh, struck up a conversation. And he was telling me that he founded this company to look at controlling periodontal disease, well, gingivitis and periodontitis, and he needed to understand the science better. And I said, well, you know, I can help you, and uh, that's where it was born. It was born from that. And, and how long ago was that? That was in 2003. Wow, yeah. so you guys have been at this long time. We've been around for a long time. So are you excited about next year? Because next year is 2020. I think yeah. you'll be able to see more clearly with 2020 vision. Right. <laughs> um, so you started in 2003 and you're almost at 2020. So 17 years. Yeah. How does this uh, company and what you're doing look 17 years later than 2003? So I'll tell you a little bit about the, the background of the company and, um, and, the, and the exciting products we've developed and, and future directions. So the idea really was to take a different look at periodontal disease, not as an infectious disease, but as a, a, a disease that is an outcome of the host response to microbes. And if, it, if that's what's driving the disease, the host response, then maybe the way to treat it would be to try and control the host response. So there's this really fascinating phenomenon that we all know as clinicians that you've got a plenty of bacteria in your mouth and that's being cleaned with the scaling and root planning, but you've got plenty of host response. So the reason you have those bacteria in your mouth is not because your immune system doesn't know how to respond to them. They're actually, your immune system's responding very well. There's plenty of inflammation. There's a whole wall of neutrophils. There's T cells, B cells, if you look at Histology, you'll find a, a very, very diverse and robust immune response to the microbes. So why are the microbes not going away? Well, it turns out that the microbes associated with gingival inflammation and periodontal disease actually benefit from, those, from that host response. They're living off the response. We think of it as a host response. They think of it as nutrients, food source, etc., so one of the fascinating things about, if we come back to Porphyrmonus gingivalis, but it's true of a lot of those bacteria, is that they do not use sugar as a nutrient source. They're what's called asaccharolytic. They do not use glucose, sugar. What they do use is proteins. So they all have very, very powerful proteases, enzymes that break down proteins. So what, what is inflammation? So you're not, saying they're on a keto diet or, <laughs> or the caveman diet? Or what, what is the all meat diet paleo called? Paleo diet. So you're yeah. saying PJ and Valleys are on paleo? Well, I'm saying that, that you can just look at it as them loving inflammation. So they are lovers of inflammation because inflammation provides protein. It's a very protein-rich environment. And, and how does inflammation provide protein? Because a lot of those host response <clears throat> factors are proteins. So we think of the cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha, interleukin 1 beta. We think of them as very powerful activators of the immune system, makes the cells kill bacteria better. That's what it's supposed to do. But what are they? They're proteins. And actually, it's been shown in, in very nice studies that the proteases, those enzymes from the bacteria, like porphyrmonus gingivalis, break down the cytokines and use so them what as I, sources for... So what I'm hearing you say is we should eat more candy because <laughs> P. gingivalis only wants protein. Yeah. <laughs> well, then maybe we'd get more carries. <laughs> we could shift ourselves over, maybe. What I'm saying is that the bacteria, and actually there's a great term in the literature now, they're inflammophilic, lovers of inflammation. So really, if we want to control the bacteria, we need to control the inflammation, which is really why if you keep, if you maintain a healthy uh, environment, you know, healthy gums, it's more, it's less likely that the bacterial plaque will outgrow again, will grow again, because 
it, in order for it to grow, it needs the hygiene to go down. So the well, hygiene is playing to, a major role. I have here. to tell you uh, yeah. something that I've seen as clinical observation. Um, you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody or say anything, but I, I have a patient who's a hygienist who's um, one of my mentors and role models and is uh, older than I. She has had the most perfect home care around the clock her whole life. She doesn't have systemic, she doesn't have diabetes. She, she, she's doing everything right and she's so motivated and she's had such horrible results and she's lost teeth and she's cried. And she, so when someone says something over simplistic, well, you, you just don't brush and floss. Come on, come on, man. That's too oversimplistic right. because we've all had patients that have tried harder than anyone. And then another thing we see is we see, um, again, people who try real hard coming in every three months with gum disease. And then you got Billy Bob who hasn't tried at all and he doesn't have gum disease. Yeah. So, so there's, so something's not adding up. I agree with you hundred percent. And I think there's a big problem in oversimplifying periodontal disease. The oversimplification starts with calling it by one name, <laughs> okay? So, you know, there's many, many forms and many differences, and periodontal disease in Billy Bob is not the same as periodontal disease in Karen and not the same as periodontal disease in John, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are many variants of this process. They can cause ultimately the same clinical outcomes, maybe, of bone loss and tooth loss, et cetera. Um, you know, because eventually down the road, if you have enough disease, you will activate the osteoclasts, they will absorb bone, and you will get those teeth will start to come out. But, um, but that doesn't mean the way you got there is going to be the same. So I think there is a variant where, yes, you know, um, poor hygiene is contributing to the process. But there is a variant for sure where you got pristine hygiene and you're still getting it. And why could that be? Well, there's many possibilities, one of which is the host factors in that individual. That individual is producing something that's driving the disease. Um, you know, because the disease ultimately is a combination of the microbes, the factors that activate the, the osteoclasts with the outcome of bone resorption, uh, you know, receding gums, receding, bone resorbed, uh, loose teeth, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm not trying to oversimplify. I'm just trying to point out that in the, in the common variant of periodontal disease where you have poor hygiene that's a factor in the driving of the, of the disease, you would want to control the, the inflammation, reduce the inflammation in order to better control the bacteria. So you're actually trying, it's counterintuitive, especially for me coming from medicine. You know, usually you think, well, one second, I'm going to make the person, if I'm going to shut off the inflammatory response, well, they'll be more susceptible to the bacteria. Here, it's really the opposite. I can shut off some of the inflammation to make them less susceptible to the bacteria. And that was where Izun, our company, was born. It was born of that idea. Can we control the inflammation in order to have better clinical outcomes? And where does Izun come from? So Izun comes from the Hebrew word for balance. And the idea was to restore the balance in the in the oral cavity. So I assume is Hebrew. It's a Hebrew balance. word for balance. I think that is so amazing how the language um, faded away, and then almost eighteen hundred years later was brought back to life. Yeah, that's a. Is, is any is any story. other um, tribe done that before? Have you no, do you know of any other languages that disappeared for two millennia? And then we're brought back to life? I, I don't. <laughs> so, so was that I your don't. native tongue? No, my native tongue is, is uh, English. And where were you born and raised? Born and bred in Manhattan, New York. And when, at what age did you learn Hebrew? Uh, very early. Very so early? I started very early. I just think that's, that, that, yeah. that's just amazing that somebody was so motivated to bring back... Uh, my, my, my oldest sister is fluent in Hebrew. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, she's a Catholic nun, and when she joined the nunnery... Um, I had bought her a, uh, uh, MacBook pro and then her, uh, nunnery wanted a bunch of stuff translated. And so she learned, uh, Hebrew, Greek, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And Latin, all the classical and, languages. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, she's my oldest. I'm 57. She's 60. And, um, my gosh, she's, uh, one of the fastest translators wow. in, uh, in the, in the cloistered Carmelite monastery. 
And uh, I give credit for uh, Steve Jobs' MacBook Pro. <laughs> I think it's because she's the only nun who had a MacBook Pro. Or maybe she was the first cloistered monk who had a, a MacBook Pro. So that's Izoom, Hebrew meaning... Balance. Balance. So kind of like um, yin-yang, the... Uh, exactly. The, what's that symbol? The uh, yeah. yin-yang symbol? Yin kind of like that? Kind of like that. And, and really it's because we also are a company focused on using botanicals in order to treat gingival inflammation. And botanicals just meaning plant? Correct. We, we use only natural plant materials. So the idea is also restoring the balance from nature to, um, to restore health. Um, and it is a, I mean, we're an animal. You're using plants. Right. Penicillin was a fungi. Right. Uh, for eukaryotes. Yeah. Uh, so actually, we're a eukaryote, right? An animal, yes. A complex yeah, eukaryote. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're a multicellular, multicellular eukaryotic eukaryo. organism. And right. then there's archaea. Oh, there's archaea. It, it, there's and what it is archaea? Those are a type of, well, you could think of them as a type of bacteria. A type of bacteria. Yeah. But I know it's, um, um, I know it's, gets, I remember when my kids were in high school, I was like, okay, this has gotten a lot more complicated <laughs> than when I graduated from college. I can't wait to help my uh, grandkids. I got my four boys have turned into five grandkids. I can't wait to help them with their homework because I'm sure it's going to be a third more complex. So what was the first um, product that you guys decided to make? Okay. Where did all this lead to first and how many products have you made? Okay. So <clears throat> the basic idea was to use botanicals and apply them topically to areas of inflammation in order to reduce the, the clinical endpoints of inflammation. Um, and what we did was we screened botanicals early on. We, 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 in, the begin, in the very beginning, we had a patching machine and we would just, um, a tableting machine, we would make mucosal adherent tablets and we, we had all of these botanicals. And, and the idea was that you could use botanicals that had a very strong ethnobotanical safety record. And you're using them in their full form rather than trying to extract a compound from them. So you really have the safety confidence um, of a very long history of safety for, for many botanicals. And we would uh, tablet them into small tablets and look on the gingerba clinically. Um, and we so found this is, a combination. This is serious research. Yeah, well, that was really very early clinical research, clinically driven research, rather than going to a mouse or going to you know, cell culture, which I'll tell you about in a second. So we found that um, a very... Uh, defined ratio of three botanicals. This is Sambucus nigra, Centella asiatica, um, and Echinacea purpurea. Those are three botanicals that when combined, we had the best clinical effect. And then the idea was, okay, we're scientists, we're physicians, we're dentists, we're not, you know, out, uh, out there in the, in the world of uh, complementary medicine. We're trying to do this in a very scientific manner. We really need to know that each time we produce this, it's gonna have that bioactivity. We need to know how to control it when it's manufactured. We need to know how to formulate it. So all of these things became the reason why we have established our own laboratories. We have a lot of chemistry and biology going on. And all of that is in order to have the best quality control system for production of what's essentially a multi uh, uh, a um, multi component product. Okay, so if you make um, you know acetaminophen, or if you make codeine, or something, your 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 quality control is trying to get to greater than ninety nine percent pure of a compound. We're using botanicals. There's hundreds of compounds in there. So how do you get your head around that and do it in a scientific manner? So the way to do it is to do quality control. Okay, is to really know what your material is. So we, we do quantitative chemistry. So we have um, several HPLC uh, machines. I'll take you through the lab. Um, and we're, we're actually following marker compounds that can be quantitated in each of these botanicals. Um, but really, the, the major leap forward was to, to build a quality control system that's biologically based. So I told you we want to control inflammation. So basically what we've done is show with a battery of tests using cells in vitro, okay, so now we're talking about cells in a culture dish, where you can stimulate them. You can stimulate them with the same kinds of 
factors that are stimulating them in the oral cavity, such as lipopolysaccharide. We all learned about it, right? This is what's coming from the gram-negative bacteria that's activating the inflammation in the oral cavity. So you can take that LPS, that lipopolysaccharide, activate cells in culture, and they will produce all of those cytokines that we know are associated with inflammatory disease in the oral cavity. Well, what we showed was the botanicals, it was one of the ways we confirmed our activity, the botanicals will block that production of cytokines by the cells in vitro. So that's a nice experiment, but what we did, which was much better, is use that as a quality control system to assure the fact that when we produce the products, which I'll tell you about in a second, those will have botanicals that are actually, we know, we're confident that they're biologically active botanicals. So we had these three botanicals. We figured out the right ratio. We figured out the best way to extract them, to get them into a medium that they could be formulated into a dental product. And then we had two goals. We said we want to treat areas where there's a lot of inflammation. We know some people have inflammation all over their mouth, and some people just have a very localized area that needs to be controlled. So we developed two products. One is a patch, so it's a mucoadhesive patch. That's the perio patch. Um, let me open one. So do you have a... I want to open the box. Okay. So, Raphael, will you lay down on the table and be the patient? <laughs> so we have perio patch. It comes uh, like this. And it's a mucoadhesive patch. Okay, so you get a package of six. And this is really designed to be applied, and you can see it actually in the... Um, show, show it closer to the uh, camera. Okay, so it's a pa package of six patches. And what's inside each, each one is the perio patch, as you can see, color matched for the gingiva. And basically one side is mucoadhesive, so that when it's in a moist environment, it will stick to the gingival tissue. And what's happening when it sticks there is that it's releasing these three botanicals in the, uh, in the ratio required for um, reducing inflammation. So you're, you're using an extremely safe, natural, uh, naturally derived product to control inflammation. And we have excellent clinical results, which have been published in several papers. Um, so that's, uh, this is a white paper we have showing we've done <coughs> clinical studies uh, published in the literature where we reduce uh, gingival inflammation measured by the gingival index. Okay, so you could just... And where could they find that white paper at? So you can go to our website and uh, follow the links for the scientific literature. Website well, being Izun Pharma. Did I pronounce it right? Izun. Yes. Izun Pharma. I Z U N. Hebrew for balance. Right. And then Pharma. No, but the, the website is actually Izun Oral Care. We say oh. Izun, but Izun is also fine. So it's Izun. www. Izun Oral Care. Com. Okay, so what's the website, Izun Pharma? So we have a parent company because we're doing a lot of different products, not just oral care. Okay. I can tell you about that in a minute. Let me, I'll finish with this and then I'll okay. go on and tell you about the, um, the, uh, the other products being developed by Izun. So this, what, this is on IzunOralCare.com? Correct. Okay. okay so and what is this white paper going to tell them? It's going to tell them about the, the clinical results with application of this perio patch um, for control of inflammation in a localized area. Now you can apply several of them and control inflammation in several areas, but we have a complementary product which is really for whole mouth treatment, which is an oral care rinse. And that's again, using the same three botanicals, formulating them in a rinse that doesn't cause any tooth discoloration. Um, which chlorhexidine does. Correct and um, that has antibacterial activity, so it has some CPC in it. It has some- What is CPC? CPC is- um, uh, It's pop quiz this. time. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, CPC is the antibacterial. It's acetylpyridinium chloride. Okay. I forgot that for a second. Um, that's an antibacterial. The, the botanicals also have antibacterial activity. And there's three antibacterials. There's three botanicals in there. Three botanicals, yes. and what are those again? 
Those are Echinacea purpurea, Centella asiatica, and Sambucus nigra. And those are all prokaryotes? Those are or, botanicals. Those are botanicals. Those are all plants. Plant. Plants, yeah. Plant material. And those are the names of three plants? Yes. Those are, 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 those, plants. are those plants that the dentist might have growing in his front yard, backyard, or these um, weird exotic yeah, plants? Yeah, in North America. Well, so Sambucus nigra is, is a European plant. Um, and then the other two, he may have, because they've been cultivated in different places, so mm -hmm. may, they may exist also. None of them are, are per se uh, North American uh, the, plants. The most common plant growing in a dentist's backyard, I've noticed, is always cannabis. But that's another story. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so so um, yes. how long have these, as this patch and mouthwash, been available? Maybe he wants to say something. <laughs> how, how long um, have they been on the market? Uh, we launched the uh, patch and the rinse um, on the American market some three years ago, and we've been using uh, rep, sales representatives representing us on old him. We have a dedicated website for dental professionals, uh, but it's right now it's concentrated in the uh, New York. Uh, what's the right? How do you determine that? Eastern uh, Eastern region. And what's the dedicated website? Is that that's the azunaolcare.com. Okay. And what is um as we go around the world, where has the most early who's been the early adopters? Is it which countries? So it's only at this stage in the United States. Nice. We're finally number one in something. <laughs> Unbelievable. You go, America. Um so you to so the early adopters are American, is that because Billy is um, is that because of Billy? Well, that, that's that's the market that we know. That's that the U.S. market is generally the market that most people try to get into initially. Um, so, and Zoom, as Gabe will explain the different areas, the company is predominantly an R and D company where we we produce products and there are other areas of uh, products that we'll get into in a second where we look to find partners rather than going direct to market ourselves. That's not been our traditional strength. So are you trying to find a partner now in America? Correct. Well, well you're talking to a lot of dentists in America. What, what are you looking for in a partner? We're looking for someone who's got distribution channels for our product. So would that be a distributor? Could be a distributor, yes. Which you guys call depots, right? I don't know. I'm not, I can't, I'm not familiar with that, that term. I keep hearing... Uh, like, I keep hearing in Israel they refer to uh, Shine Patterson Burke or Benko as depots. I haven't heard that. No, 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 not not necessarily depots. But, but so it may be a distributor. What what who else may it um, could be? It would it would be a distributor in the dental in the dental space. So it's already me, you know, having that relationship with the dental professional. The the zonal care rinse, the periactive, is also potentially uh, I think uh, an over the counter product. Uh, opportunity with again with the which would be B to C. Yes. So right now it's um, Billy to the doctor. That's B to B. Yes. So you're uh, so that would be, but you might later have a instead of a B to B a B to C business to consumer mouthwash. Correct. Okay. Well, we'll go back to uh, uh, okay. so. our our chief microbiologist here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. That, that sort of was the approach behind developing these two oral care products, the Perio patch, uh, localized delivery for an inflamed area, the, the whole mouth approach with periactive uh, mouth rinse. Now, you could imagine that controlling inflammation has many uh, potential uh, indications, right, for controlling inflammation. And the Zun has looked and has developed product, and as Les mentioned, we're primarily an R&D company, looking to develop uh, products for medical indications, dental and medical indications. Um, so where would you want to control inflammation? Well, when we're talking about systemic diseases. So one is when there's too much inflammation in uh, a wound that's not repairing. So that's a very common condition in diabetics, right? The condition is called diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, it's the number are, one cause of amputation in correct. America. Number one cause of amputation. It's a big chunk of the healthcare dollar, if you just look across America, is treating diabetic foot ulcers. Um, and one of the problems there is stagnated inflammation. So inflammation is one phase in wound healing, 
but you got to get over the inflammation and progress towards the healing phase. Um, and uh, the diabetic foot ulcer, many of those lesions are just stuck. And they're stuck because there's just too much inflammation there. And that has a lot to do with the diabetic process. So, of course, the less controlled you are as a diabetic, the more at risk you are for these diabetic foot ulcers. Um, and <clears throat> we said, well, here we have a topical treatment that can downregulate inflammation. Why not use it in diabetic foot ulcers? And we then went through a formulation phase and developed a hydrogel that incorporates the three botanical ingredients and did an um, 80 patient trial in diabetic foot ulcers showing great results uh, in terms of uh, accelerating the time to wound healing. So that was one very exciting area. Well, that has to make you feel very warm and fuzzy yeah. inside. <laughs> Was so that, was, has right. that been the biggest professional validation in your life so far? Um, I mean, could you imagine getting your foot amputated? Yeah, that's a major one. That's a major. That would be a setback. Thing. One of the, yes, one of the um, exciting things is going on here is the ability to develop. Uh, but has that been your products? most exciting professional? It's definitely up there. Definitely up there. Well, I, I, want, I want to move back to the mouth because uh, you were talking about periodontal disease, but um, as you know. Um, the fastest growing part of dentistry is placing implants. And the biggest problem in implants is periimplantitis. And yes. um, you can find almost as many theories on what periimplantitis is um, as there are theories, you know, abound. There's, I mean, some people, you know, I don't want to go into that, but have you looked at this product with periimplantitis? Yes, we have. And um, this is, that's a great one in your follow-up podcast with Bill because he was in charge of that study. Um, we did a periimplantitis. Well, I thought this would be a good time to talk about <laughs> Bill behind his back <laughs> when he's in New York. He, he's on the other side of the world. That's He'll right. never hear this podcast. Well, I think it's best that he tells you about the study, but yes, absolutely. I think periimplantitis, which we know the inflammation there is progressing even faster and is more difficult to control than in, than in periodontitis. Um, and it's an ideal place since it's a localized to use the patch, and then you can add on the rinse. So the patch could wrap around. The patch can go around the mucosal tissue that's that's um, around the implant. Yes. Wow. See, the the, the one of the biggest problems with periimplantitis is patient selection. I mean, the person who starts losing their teeth, that's not the person free of disease had great home care, you know, right. that goes to yoga every day and <laughs> eats tofu. Right. It's usually Billy Bob, your smoking, drinking right. buddy friend. Right. And uh, so the people who need implants the most... Are at most risk. Are at most risk. That's the nice yeah. political yeah. way to say it. <laughs> so um, so what do you... How, how does that make you think about the implants were placed in the most at-risk patients... And now they have periimplantitis. Does that change? How well, you I, look think at this? That, I think that uh, part of risk assessment before placing an implant has to include the, the patient characteristics. But it's, it's but, tough but because think, yeah, no, it's I, tough because somebody, save somebody's. Um, if someone, if someone, you know, how many times have you seen your loved one do something that wasn't a great idea? I mean, right. you, you know, you're not going to take care of it. It was kind of like my boys. You know, I, I noticed that if um, they wanted, say, they wanted a bike. If I bought them the bike, they'd, they'd leave it on the front porch. But if they had to pay half of it, right. had skin in the game, they'd park it in the garage and, and hide it. Right. But it, it's tough because they're a young dentist, yeah. and you think the dentist is the dog wagging the patient tail. But when you're young, some of these patients are the tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. And some of these young dentists, they think, nah, I shouldn't do this. But the patient talks them into it. And I kind of, as, as an American, um, think, well, you know, it's your money, it's your life, it's your time. So that, what I'm saying is this is a big debate. Even, even one of the biggest legendary implantologists of all time, Carl Misch, <clears throat> and his younger brother Craig is one of the greatest implantologists of all time today, um, had that dispute. Um, Craig won't put an implant in a smoker. Carl would. Mm -hmm. Also, it's your body, it's your money, it's your mouth. I mean, obviously, no one's saying you should smoke more. Right. Obviously, everyone knows they should not smoke, but some people can't quit smoking. And um, so... I think one of the... I, yeah, so I, I, I hear it, and, uh, and I'm not a dentist myself, but 
I, I do think that one of the things that would be nice for dentists would be to have a toolbox of options to treat an early periimplantitis lesion, a more progressed periimplantitis lesion, before you actually lose that implant. Um, and, and I think the perio patch and the rinse are excellent options for early intervention. You start seeing inflammation developing around those implants. Well, you now have something in your toolbox. Don't just sit there and just, you know, scale. And back to the kids, one thing I've been noticing more and more and more, the, <clears throat> the plastic surgeons, which, you know, 80% of their surgeries on women. And, um, they have a rule that they're not going to do a uh, face job, tummy tug, breast augmentation, unless you quit smoking for just six weeks before the surgery and six weeks after. And the one thing I've noticed uh, more and more that a lot of girls, you know, when, when you tell them you got to quit smoking forever, that's that they're overwhelmed, mm. but they can get their hands around six weeks. And then after they have the surgery, a lot of those people, they, they never go back to it. So I think that's a compromise that you might think about it. Um, what if you just got them to sm quit smoking and you say, okay, you cannot have one cigarette 10 days before this implant surgery. And if you do, I'm not going to do it. Well, if they can get through 10 days, most of the uh, withdrawal is four days. Right. And if they can get through 10 days, you give an implant, you might have just created a non-smoker. That's a great, uh, <laughs> you know. Great public health intervention uh, idea. So those were your first two products, yes. Perioactive, and what was the name of the patch? Perio Patch. Perio Patch and Perioactive Mouthwash. Yep. And how much is a box of uh, Perio Patch? I'm going to turn over the lights for that. <laughs> uh, currently, they, we sell one pack of six envelopes, theoretically, for $25 to the dental professional, who then on sells it to his patients. And the periactive rinse uh, is uh, currently marketed at a, to dentists at uh, nine dollars fifty, uh, nine dollars seven dollars fifty a box, uh, seven dollars fifty a bottle with a case of twelve per. So seven fifty a bottle for the mouthwash, twenty five for the patch, and that's to the dental profession. To the dental profession. And then, We'll and then the can the uh, patient buy that on the website? I mean, is it on Amazon or? No, at this stage, it's really a dental professional product. So you're only selling it B2B? Correct. Yeah, it's embarrassing when a dentist sells something to his patient and they find it on Amazon. Uh, I remember when I got out of school, they came out with Interplaque. And they, they wrote, remember the Interplaque was one of the first electric toothbrushes back in the, in the late 80s. And they had this big push of the dentist to buy them and sell them to the patient. So I bought a case and it was a, it was a big, I think it was like 12 at like $80 a piece, which is a lot of money 30 years ago. And the, I, after selling the second one, she brought it back and said, well, I can buy this at Walgreens for $8 oh. cheaper. And I'm like, what? Oh. You know, it's like, they, thanks, Interplac. Yeah. And uh, so on. So this is purely a B2B product. And they would order it at um, easinoralcare.com. Okay. So um, any other products since then? Wait a minute. My bouncer has a secret message. You are pointing to the your watch. Does that mean shut up, Howard? Uh, they got to go? What does that mean? <laughs> we would like to visit their facility to clean us down. So you want to continue this uh, podcast on a tour? Or what do you? Or what do you want to do? No. Well, I mean, I don't want to film anything proprietary. Yeah. So, so you just uh, because do you want to quickly just say the other products that we're working on? Yeah, yeah, just just, we'll just sure. let's just wrap up with the products. Okay, you're good. On. So again, the idea: control inflammation topically using these very safe and um, quality controlled botanical ingredients. Uh, with uh, formulation. So we, we also, in addition to the diabetic foot ulcer, Hydrogel, developed a rinse specifically for oral mucositis. So as um, dentists, you're probably very aware that uh, cancer patients being treated with chemotherapy, and especially if you're getting radiation in addition to the chemotherapy, especially if it's radiation to the head and neck uh, fields, uh, you're at very high risk for developing oral mucositis, which is an inflammatory breakdown of the mucosal tissue with ulceration. Um, that's very painful. Actually, cancer patients, patients being treated for cancer, 
are rating it usually as the, the most bothersome of the side effects of uh, anti-cancer therapies. Um, and, and of course, it, it also, not only is it a big problem for quality of life for the patient, but, but it's also a reason that patients can't get their full regimen of anti-cancer therapies, chemotherapy and radiation. So we developed a rinse specifically to prevent and reduce the symptoms of oral mucositis and have tested that in a um, uh, multi-center trial in the United States and Israel in uh, head and neck cancer patients being treated with chemo radiation. So the results of that trial show that in the worst, in the cases of um, severe oral mucositis, if you're treated with the rinse, then you have a better uh, outcome in terms of your oral mucositis. So that's in addition to the diabetic foot ulcer, a very exciting uh, about, direction for the company. Is oral mucositis is that back to, is that eukaryote or prokaryote? Because I'm thinking. With HIV, you have um, fungi, you have thrush, candidiasis. Um, right. How does that? Right. Well, again, here we're really targeting the host inflammatory response. So oral mucositis, the breakdown is because, well, it's multifactorial, but it's really the, the in the in the um, uh, vasculature of the mucosa. Okay. So those vessels are very inflamed, and the the inflammation causes a breakdown of the overlying epithelium. Um, so it's really not microbial driven. It's inflammation driven. Interesting. I, I never knew yeah. that. Right. So you then do have microbes that That's now have That's the first thing I think I've ever been point. unaware of. <laughs> I know all other knowledge, but I, I, yeah, I did not. I always thought mucositis was, um, was micro driven. Yes. No, it's actually, it's the damage caused by the anti neoplastic or anti cancer therapies that are causing it used to be thought just of a cell turnover that the and because the they're, the anti cancer therapies are targeting proliferating cells, so it's the epithelium that's proliferating. But it's really more, much more than that. It's the underlying vasculature that's being uh, damaged by oxidative damage so I and know, other inflammation. I know what my homies are thinking. They're thinking, what about um, after wisdom to dry socket? Um, Oh, you should talk to Bill about that. Should I talk podcast. to Bill about that? Yeah. Absolutely. Because, because he's, used, he's used the perio patch and dry socket with amazing results. Because, he's the clinician, so. Yeah, because that's amazing because we do see some strange variables. Yeah. Like more common in women and on birth control pills. Mm. So if it's, you know, men don't take birth control pills and men aren't women. So that, that alone <laughs> makes you think something different's going yeah. on but so he'll, he'll be the one to talk about yeah, that yeah absolutely talk so you're his, you're his uh chief scientist or you medical guy you're, you're his chief uh, medical officer and les is the chief financial officer so he knows where all the money is hidden and um okay. and then we'll do a follow-up podcast uh with dr william z levine um who's a periodontist yes a dmd yes and uh where did he go to dental school he went to dental school in Columbia. Which is in Manhattan. Columbia and Manhattan. Which is uh, NYU. And they just opened up. Not in NYU. He was in Columbia. Yeah, but it's in Manhattan. Yes. Along with NYU. Yes, correct. And NYU, by the way, is the largest dental school in America. Oh, 7% really? of all the dentists graduated from NYU. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and Manhattan just opened up their third dental school. Oh, that's Turo? Yes. Yeah. That, that's that. in Manhattan, right? Yes, also in Manhattan. And, um, and then Actually, you got, I think it's in Valhalla, New York. Maybe it's outside Manhattan. Oh, I'm is not it? sure. Yeah, Valhalla. Valhalla. Is that a? That's is that a, upstate? That's in Westchester County, I believe. Uh, don't but, quote me on that one. <laughs> but is that upstate? Like, because the other one's in Buffalo. Yeah, SUNY SUNY. No, Buffalo. this is very close to, to Manhattan, but okay. it's outside Manhattan, I think. Valhalla. Okay. Yeah. The, the two well, we'll have to put a million dollar bet on that because <laughs> the dean told me she was in Manhattan. So oh, it could be it's in Manhattan. I, I don't know, Forget but it. I I've never heard. But what was the city you said? Forget it, Valhalla. It's. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I've never no, it's heard in Manhattan. If she said it's in Manhattan, then I thought Manhattan. she told me that. But anyway, um. <laughs> Well, you know, um, thank you so much for letting okay. me invade your your work day. I'm sure you had uh, far it's better great. things to do for an hour than talk to my homies, <laughs> and uh, you were just unbelievably informative. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I cannot wait to um, um, podcast William afterwards. Great. He's probably going to chew me out for referring to the bad patient as Billy Bob. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, thank okay. you very much. Good, you're welcome.